So before we ever started doing this podcast, the Any Given Monday podcast, I would have no idea. If you gave me a couple of different questions on what is bike fit, I probably wouldn't get it right or have a clue what's going on until Eric, you brought up in the podcast out of the blue, gave me no hints on it. And I was like, what are you talking about? Eric, now you've got someone else to explain what exactly a bike fit or bike fit you call it at the time is. What is what is going on with this? What exactly does it do? It's not exactly just how fit you are spinning in, in, in a spinning studio or anything like that. So what is bike fit and what, what's yeah. going on with it? Bike fit's a little bit more than a spin class, all right. And to be honest, I knew nothing about it myself. I, I bought a bike in 2019 and I went into the shop and I said, I know nothing about bikes. And they said, here you go. And I said, thanks very much. <laughs> and off I, off I went. And I probably cycled the bike that when I did my triathlons in 2019 that didn't fit me or wasn't fit right to me. Uh, probably cost myself so much pain and anguish by cycling this thing that was just not right for me. But I didn't know any different. Did mm. um, And then I we did Mizzen to Malin. And we went into Cycle Superstore and we went looking for sponsorship with the Air Corps. And in fairness, they were so good to us. And I just seen, I was like, bike fit. I was like, what's going on in here? And I just walked in and I was like, do you do bike fittings? And he was like, yeah, yeah. And this is why we're bringing on the expert in bike fitting. And it's Gary Byrne. Gar, thanks so much for coming on to join us. How are you keeping? All good, yeah. yeah. Thanks for having us on there. And uh, yeah, I do tend to run on. So if I start talking too much, uh, put a stop up on me there. But, uh, <laughs> I'm, here, I'm here to answer any questions and inform people about the actual the art of bike fitting. Um, and just about myself there, I am based in the Cycle Superstore. I, I was a manager with the guys there for over 10 years. And the opportunity came in to actually take over a bike fitting business. I was on site. Since that, I did that in 2019. I've been learning more and more by the week about the biomechanics of how to get people fitted on the bike ride, how to minimize injury, how to get the max power out of people. And I find it extremely rewarding just dealing with people as they come in. Everyone has their own story. Everyone has a bit of difference wrong with them. Everyone has some little niggles they need to actually remove. And the person who's actually sitting on their bike thinking they're grand, I can cycle behind them for two minutes. I can find them five different things that are just wrong, just that extra couple of little milk to get an extra bit of power out of them get a bit of extra bit of comfort especially on the longer days so just to give a, a background into us so i've got a bike fit from gar and we did the ring of kerry cycle but luckily the last time i fitted you fitted me for the ring of kerry so i felt mm. very comfortable on my bike on the ring of kerry sean was cycling his missus's bike which is about one <laughs> two sizes too small for him <laughs> gary everything was on my fit and the helmet didn't even fit my head gary that's how bad i am so if i'm very quiet in this episode of the podcast is because i'm absorbing the whole thing i got one mount and two ears for a reason i tend to use my two ears for most of this podcast gary how did you get into bike fit uh, I've been selling high-end bikes for over 20 years now in and out of various bike shops around the town and it's actually it's something I the, the opportunity came to actually buy the business as a retail fitter and get the retail business license so retail will be the premium bike fitting technologies that are out there that have 3D motion capture cameras and a lot of it, actual in-depth details but again came into it actually the guy who was there ahead of me was actually emigrating back to Australia the opportunity was there to take over the business and I'd watched him fitting over the five or six years he was there in the superstore before me and I saw that the, the quality of the fits he was doing how good the results people were getting out of it and I'm really happy I did actually take the plunge and actually invest in myself there and actually take the chance because but it wasn't like I, it wasn't like you didn't know anything about bikes you've been in the industry oh no, look at, years and you yeah. cycle a hell of a lot yourself you, you can yeah, feel yeah. yourself when it's not right yeah, no, like I, I know myself, like I, I've never driven a car in my life. Um, I commute everywhere around Dublin on my bike by various machines, depending on what I'm doing. Uh, I worked as a courier throughout most of the 90s doing crazy mileage around town. Did bits of racing here and there, and more so the longer and di distance endurance stuff once the legs are right, I'm actually able to get out of it there. But yeah, it's from experience of getting people, like when you buy a bike in the shop there, most of the staff would be, in any bike shop, we'll be able to get people to within a centimetre of being ideal. But that last centimetre is the key one. Getting the saddle just perfect and getting the, the foot position. Cleaning position is immensely important, just getting the feet over that there. But um, it's it's from a build-up of the knowledge. And I've had to relearn a couple of times because the stuff we knew in the 90s doesn't hold anymore for a lot of the stuff because the bikes have changed. Mm -hmm. Biomechanics we thought of in the early 2000s 
that's actually been improved on and actually refined because we have 3D motion capture camera. We've got parameters on bikes. We've got the data coming back in off riders where we can actually see. Try this, same rider, try another thing, different position, and try it again. See what the power outputs and see what the aerodynamics are like on you. Just to fine tune it. And all that data is feeding back into the, the number field that we're using. Again, and again, like we're so numbers driven. Like everyone's wearing a Garmin now. Everyone's looking to get that extra mile. We mentioned in a couple of weeks ago, people trying to do the sub eight, sub seven Ironman. All of it was data. They're coming off bikes and they're piercing their ears just to get a blood sample just to see how they're they're reacting to food on bikes. So data is important. But yeah. in terms of the average Joes, like we are, and and what mm. we am, I want to be average. I don't think I'm going to be an expert level but I don't want to be in pain doing it. And that starts with the right bike choice. So I suppose, Gar, when people come in, what should they be looking for? Because people are going to throw around carbon frame, aluminium frame, this fork, that fork, wheels bigger than me. You know, like, what what do you do when you walk into the shop and you go, well, first of all, you walk into the right shop, as you said, staff know what they're looking for, but what do you look for when you're looking for that first bike? Well, if I was looking for competition grade bikes for people who are getting into the sport, I'd be looking at at least 10 speed drivetrain on it. So in Shimano, that would be a Tiagra drivetrain. And a bike like that will generally start off with aluminium and a carbon fork. And these days, it's pretty much all disc wheels, but there are still some rim brake wheels on around there. That in somewhat the right size, because the final details of bike fitting can actually be changed on quite a lot of the machines. Or you can get the last couple of mil adjusted just to, to point you in the rider. And if a guy is in between two sizes, you're actually generally better off going the smaller of the two because you can always make the smaller bike that bit bigger. A bigger bike, you will be stuck. Now, in 2020, when bike stops were really, really low, we got a lot of people working on the bikes that we had in stock just because they were the only things optional. But now, when you're between the two sizes, we go to go edge on the uh, uh, size on the edge of caution and actually go a little bit smaller because we can always increase it out. And just to explain that, so yeah. sizes mm. of bikes come in inches. So for yeah. me, Mongo, second hand is not really an option for me because my size frame was a 62 inch frame. Yeah, that's, uh, that's in centimeters, so 62 centimeters. Or centimeters, so, sorry. Yeah. And, yeah. and the average is around the 54 52, 54, 56. 56, yeah, depending on the, on the finishing kit on it. So that's what you mean by by yeah. bike size frame. So it's better to be in the centimeter smaller than the bigger because, as you said, you're stuck. And then the speeds are essentially a ten speed is you've got twenty gears. Yeah, so ten ten gears on the rear, and then it's uh, like it's up to twelve now at the minute with the competition bikes. Um, and Sean learned about what that was <laughs> when you're going up a hill and when you click and nothing happens, you're out of gears. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is true. Uh, the well, thing about the, the the bikes the past ten years is the lower gear has actually got a lot lot lower. So bike from fifteen years ago, you'd be harder pushing climbing the hill now to what we have now, because yeah, the the the, the lowest gear makes it easier to climb and spin the legs that bit faster because it's all about yeah. the spins now. And that, that's the difference. So, so you you just touched on there, certainly go. Um, now I, I'm gonna butcher a conversation Eric had one of our friends uh, in the ring, Kerry, a couple weeks ago. He had an old um, Lance Armstrong bike. Uh, he says he has, and he says that it was more about pounding the gears or pounding the thing, whereas now it's more about spinning now these days. Uh, without saying he's right, because I'd hate for him to listen to the podcast and hear he was right in anything, how much has ha, has bike changed o- over the years? Like, So if someone had a 10-year-old bike, like, are, are you cycling it differently to how you'd cycle it now? It's, or cycle the, cycling it? Or? The... the gearing technology has got better to make a bigger gear possible on the rear which actually makes it easier to climb a hill now from the the coaching books i have from the from the mid 80s to the 90s it was all about pushing a bigger harder gear but that was the manufacturing mm. technology was the limit of that you only had seven or eight speeds on the rear and you couldn't get so big so the bigger the sprocket is in the back the easier is to pedal up the hill okay a, an early 2000s mid 2000s bike the, the highest range of gears you'd have on the rear, the 11 teeth on the smallest, and probably 27 on the biggest. Now, the 12 speed bikes now have 11 sprockets, 10 sprockets in some cases, or 10 gears on the on the lowest, and up to 34, 36 on the rear. 
they're almost like a mountain bike gear range on the rear so it does make it a lot easier to climb the hill but the answer unfortunately is yeah now we know it's more bioefficient to actually pedal faster with less strain on the muscles and it's like going to the gym and lifting many reps of a two kilo weight then really straining yourself and trying to lift the 20 kilo weights and actually straining it's like pushing a bigger gear is like lifting weights whereas spinning a gear is like doing cardio and it's so it's more, more efficient on the body. it's more efficient for cycling to move faster than yeah. slower more resistance yeah yeah so oh that gear, gr- getting the legs so does it five is optimal so there's a there's a really good exercise I do, and it's it's about so the, we work in the cycling zones and, and there's power zones, and, and we get into that a bit later. But for me to hold zone three at eighty RPM, I can do it for an hour. Ask me to slow down to fifty RPM, I am gonna be hurting very quickly because it's mashing. It is that squat rep type thing every time your leg turns over. Whereas you can add in. The, the motion into it you can add in that energy into it you take away some of that because it's in the circle you're you're putting the force the angular force in you and you're taking away that need to start each rep with the leg so the kind of momentum is keeping the spin going and that's energy efficient essentially so but i won't argue <laughs> the, in, the individual who was asking this question had done one cycle and was like oh no I need a carbon fiber bike I'm going to get better so <laughs> the argument was learn how to cycle that bike first and then, then have a look into the, the more expensive end <laughs> yeah. like the thing is you can cover any distance on just about any bike if it's if it's set up right for you um, like Sean Kelly all the lads like the stuff we have the technology now because bikes have been massive, had massive research in, in the past 20 years. And carbon, like it's, you asked me initially what's the, the ideal starter bike. If the budget can stretch to a carbon fiber bike with 11 gears on the rear or more, go for it. Because today's carbon is five, six years better than, uh, is, is twice as good as carbon from five years before that and three times better than the carbon from five years before that. The carbon these days, they're able to lay it up where the bottom bracket area where the pedals connect, that's stiff where you want it to get the power delivery on. And once you get above that range, they're, they've introduced flex and flex and compliance in the upper frame to give the comfort so it doesn't feel like you're sitting on the top of a sheet of glass getting rattled down the hill. Like, the <laughs> bike, like when you're like Eric, when you're sitting on your bike on the turbo trainer, you could see how much flex that top of the mast and the seat post actually had. Because the, the carbon's designed for that now. If you got a bike, that same model bike from 2010, because I had that one, um, it didn't. It was rigid. It was like sitting on a piece of fiberglass with actually very little compliance in the, between the two wheels. So the newer bikes track the road better. They're more comfortable. And the more comfort, the further you're going to go, the faster you're going to go. I and feel so much better about seeing the records, the hills around here, and being like three, four minutes slower than people going up like half a kilometer of a hill. Yeah. They just got really fast bikes and better gears. That's that's all there is to it. Yeah, there's I'm a lot more to it than that. But <laughs> I'm after investing in a hill climbing bike, which is uh, it's the lightest bike I've ever owned, and it's holding speeds going up the hill at 40, 45 k an hour. It's ridiculous. What is a hill climbing bike? What's what, just, can you see a difference looking at it compared to a regular uh, it's bike? Just the weight, the weight on it's actually this is pared down to the absolute minimum just to get the weight right now. It's uh, it, it's a, a look. Look frame it looks seven eight five if you as it's designed for going up the Alps and like the the Alpine stages the tour and that it's all about climbing you know, to, to the detriment of descending. For like for perspective, Gar, how heavy yeah. is it? It's with pedals on seven point one kilos. <laughs> <laughs> so they build a bike that wouldn't even size, need yeah. a lift for Sean. <laughs> <laughs> It's absolutely yeah. phenomenal how fine they've got it down to. Even yeah. the bike I've got. So initially, I when I started my cycling journey, I knew that carbon was better. Um, so I had the choice between the aluminium, the carbon with the aluminium fork, or the entry-level carbon. But I think the fork is aluminium. Um, and that's the it's one I've got. flip of that. So the alloy with a carbon fork is the way to do it because the, the carbon fork spins, um, held some of the vibrations out of it. So yeah. frame a carbon fork, then full carbon frame and fork would be the way it goes. Silly question alert. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> That's scummy me for the entire podcast. But anyway, when we're doing Ray Carey, and I've got much running cycling experience, so I was going to go back to that. Uh, a couple of stamps go up the hill, a mad gust of wind will come out of nowhere. I'm like, whoa! And a boy living in the road. With a 7.1 kilo bike, surely you're goosed. Yeah, you learn to you learn to expect the crosswinds and actually put them on. The thing is, I'm 97 kilos on the bike, so I'm I'm putting that bike onto the ground. I'm not a small lad myself, like so. Uh, I have had bikes actually when I was walking along beside them lift um, from gusts of wind, just actually was walking with the saddle and the up in the air like a kite. But uh, yeah, <laughs> like I I can't imagine that the weather conditions going up the Alps are better than the Rio Kerry. So like that that's fairly. Like, are you yeah. sacrificing? Like, you better be an experienced cyclist having this this thing going up something like the Alps with a seven point one um, kilo bike. No, no, like just with more with experience, like for crosswinds and stuff, and actually headwinds, you you learn to know how to handle and expect them. Like it's actually, I'm sure Eric, at your job, you know, you know, yeah. expect the unexpected you stuff. Yeah, yeah just so kind of lean into it. Into it and actually lean it in. It's actually like it's yeah. especially if if I'm out there moving along on a country road and there's a gap in the fence. I know to brace myself just for that gap. Or even the opposite, if I'm going down towards Nice or something on the dual carriageway mm-hmm. and there's trucks going along the side and then there's a gap in those trucks, you better brace yourself because you will get booked for it. You just have to just prepare for it. But like yeah, say, it's just, you just lean into it a little bit. But yeah. like, guys, right, you add weight yourself. So a 50 kilo cyclist is going to feel it a lot more than mm. myself car would on the bike at the yeah. 90 plus yeah. but it's it is something it's kind of like you're taking a corner without taking the corner if that makes sense yeah, yeah. and you just kind of lean in that corner comes out of nowhere yeah, yeah. So when, you get into, when you get into like the triathlon bikes with the deep six and deep six and rims like some guys are running like an 80 mil 80 mil in the front and 100 in the back but that's it, any sort of crosswind you're going to um, and 80 mil that's the length of the that, the, the width of the tire that, 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 the dip the, the depth of the actual rim for the tire will be sitting on top of that. Like so if you look at the lads doing the likes of Cone or any of the big long distance Ironman, mm. like most of the guys who are doing the, the, the international series of Ironman, they'll have a selection of wheels for the day. Like starting at forty for aero purposes, forty and sixty. So you generally put a smaller one on the front and a slightly slightly deeper one on the rear. Um but amping up to like eighty or a hundred or maybe even just a solid disc where the the disc the wheel, rear wheel itself it's just like a bear on. It's just actually a sheet. No smoke. It's, uh, it's basically like an alloy, essentially. So you have your, your basic rim, you have your tire on it. And then from that tire towards the center is the 40 mil, 80 mil, where you're filling the gap of the circle with a sheet or plastic carbon, whatever it is around, and, and they're the mill distance. And we we spoke about it last week with, with Lorcan's bike. He had the disc on the back on the TT bike. Mm. The TT is a time trial bike. It's an aero bike. It's built for speed. But they will cover that rear wheel because over a certain speed, the stats, the figures, the data says that over 30 kilometers an hour, you're actually cycling easier on them bikes. Yeah. It's easier to yeah. stay faster. So that's yeah. the, the the second time you blew me mind that now. <laughs> I, I, I have to go away and think about some of these stuff. Although I, 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 for perspective, most times on a bike, I'm on those airdyne bikes and work. So it's a completely different ball game. Go faster, I die. <laughs> I get sick. But it's the the world of cycling is it's complex. It is when you when you first walk in, especially the cycle superstar, it's a phenomenal shop. It, mm. you have every brand like every brand you can think of is there and it's like I'm looking for a bike and they're like which bike <laughs> you could spend I think I spent four hours in there looking around and, and seeing which one was going to suit and and the problem is as well there's so much choice guy now there's so much competitive edge and this was in the UCI and this was in the tour bike and this was the frame that won this this and this and and how do people I suppose what is the best method for people to find the best solution for them and that is I suppose the key thing so for me we ended up with Cube and we can get back into that but but how do people kind of cycle through brands and cycle through the, I know we said we need an 11 speed probably and go for carbon if you and budget is is going to be one but how can you find the best to make your money go the best distance for you? Well, one thing I really enjoy about working with the Superstore is they're not a pushy driven sale. It's actually they try to get the product right for the customer. 
that's that's key in something we drill into all the staff is and I was a manager with the guys there for years, not anymore. Um it's getting the right product for the for the customer. So the guy who comes in after reading the magazine saying, I want this bike, I want that, and I want to spend this much money. You just go, Well, hang on a minute, just why do you want this bike? That bike is good for the Alps or it's good for cycling around Italy. Why can it be good for Ireland or Irish roads? So where are you gonna be cycling? That's the first thing we ask them. Where are you gonna be cycling? What sort of distance are you looking at doing? Do you plan on traveling with it? Are you gonna be competing? And then it's a case of narrowing down the selection out of that because most of our clubs, well, it's there's there's a difference even in your standard road racer bike. There's what's called a race geometry bike where the handlebars are going to be a little bit lower, and then a comfort geometry bike where the handlebars are going to be a little bit higher. Um, and we call that measurement the, the handlebar stack. So the the higher the higher the handlebars are, the less leaned in you you are, the um the more upright you're going to be. It's not going to win you a race, but it's going to be comfortable over longer distances. Like it's for the endurance cyclist, for the guy who's doing two hundred plus k an hour, two hundred plus k's in a day, that's going to be the one for comfort. It actually gets the shoulders up, not impinging the hips, fits the body a little bit better. It's like the racing bikes, you'll see them lads in the Tour de France. Their back angle is around thirty five degrees, forty degrees. They're all down. They're just gunning, gunning, gunning. That's all great in your seventeen to twenty four. But it's the guys above thirty that are riding those bikes. They're doing a lot of yoga and a lot of stretching to keep the position right. Either that, or they're raising the stem up and making it, making it into endurance bike without even knowing themselves. Then the other thing we look at is again budget and availability. We're still not exactly where we want to be with stock availability across the trade. Um, twenty twenty really messed us up with lockdowns. Um, a lot of the manufacturers they're based in the far east and their lockdowns extended longer than us. Some of them. To, to, Factories were closed for two and a half years, and only now they're getting back up to. They're filling the orders from a couple of years back still. Um, we've, I've got bikes still due from 2020 that they've upped the models and replaced the models as they've come along, but we're still on that number. So I say or I needed a hundred bikes in from a certain brand in 2020, and probably only got 70 of them so far, and I'm still still due 30 of that initial order, which. Which is a bit crazy for customers walking in three years on past it saying, Look, why can't you still get the bikes? It's it's the thing, like Shimano can only make a certain amount of gears in a year, Shram can only make a certain amount of years gears in a year. Cycling as a whole has, has quadrupled over the past five years globally, from the guys who want to commute to work to the guys who are competing. And just manufacturers can't can't increase the production that fast. So the other the other thing we do look at is availability of the bikes but then also price points so it's very easy to get the man who has unlimited pockets the bike that he wants because it's generally at a much higher end the brands do have the pro spec bikes there ready to go the guy who's looking for the entry level starting into the sport at these days at around 1200 to 1500 euros you're going to have to make some compromises and that's why i was saying if you can get up to carbon gives you a bit more availability because again People want to buy a bike and ride that bike pretty much that month if they can. They don't want to be saying, yeah, you can order this bike now, give us a deposit, we'll have it for you in two years. That's getting less and less, but we did have cases like that. I had one guy waiting 14 months for his bike after paying a deposit. And we kept in touch with him, kept in touch with the supplier. But unfortunately, those delays can be there if it's, that, if it's the exact bike that you want. But um, Superstar is really lucky. The, the amount of stock they have, they will get someone moving on a bike quite quickly because... We have the space and we actually have the, the know how to get them in. Have you seen this time of year now with the Tour de France? I heard it was one of the five most watched sporting events in the world and now it's on Netflix as well. Has yeah. the demand gotten even greater over the last couple of weeks for four for bikes that you've seen? Um, yeah, you get a lot more footfall in the, in the store, but generally the guys who are buying a road bike, March to May is generally the best time for ordering because they're getting ready for all the events. Um, like the the big leisure cycles like the Wicklow 200 and the mm. Ring of Kerry and stuff you don't want to be getting your bike the week of or the month of you want to actually acclimatize yourself and get get rid of all the niggles and get used to it um, we 10 20 years ago we would have seen people all buying bikes in the middle of summer now people realise that they want to get it that they realise there's going to be a bit of a lead time when some of the bikes are after a specific one so from October on, we'll be taking orders for next year's model of bikes. Just because people know they'll be in stock in March. That's mm. when they want them. So they'll place the deposit down, get on the order list then. If the bike comes in, we can hold it for themselves. And then 
get it on soon to the right, get them moving. But uh, but yeah, like it's the tour is great for that. Summer holidays is great for getting people in, getting commuter bikes on, get the kids on the bikes. Then like because it's not just road racing and cycling, we do mountain bike stuff as well. Mountain bike itself is really good in the, in the winter. Then cyclocross, another discipline. The sport's actually got huge the past couple of years here in Ireland. We had the world champions here, championship here over in Blanchester last December. It was oh, really? over on the day. Yeah, so there's a there's a cross track over there now. But yeah, um, the tour any any big event gets people in the door. I do say now the the amount of lads I get in the bike fitting trade coming in in January after having a few drinks with their mates in the pub over Christmas, and <laughs> signing, up for, signing up for an Iron Man or something or a half Iron Man is crazy. Oh, you're ringing really bells really, there. <laughs> and really in well. steps, uh, in steps, Eric at the end of June to buy a bike. Big no no with yeah. a bike fitting twelve weeks out. What a legend! Yeah. <laughs> Eric, <What? you> plonker. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! If ever there was a man to break all the rules of what you should do, um, no, but Eric, like the thing is, you're already cycling. It's not as if it's your first bike and everything else. It's like it's, I've seen you on your existing bike. You're all well able to ride that. So this case is this when you pick up the new bike, it's going to be mint. It's going to be spot on for you. Um, I have I've actually increased the accuracy of the fit that we did. So the next time I have you in, I'm gonna dial it in all the way because I changed one or two specs on on the actual fit. And this is this is the good thing, and we'll talk a little bit about my fitting. Um, but there's one pet hate I want to talk about first. But the 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 bike fitting itself is amazing. We'll get into it. But what do you think mm. of electric bikes? I think they're brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I what think do you think of people... electric bikes on charity cycles? Again, like the thing is, if it's getting people out pedaling and turning the legs, like it's the lads who obviously wouldn't think of doing it before. Ah, oh, Gary, you're so Gary. A how 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 how, how so much you turn the? I've never used electric bike over at this. Is how much are you you really? Yeah, I I see your point when you put it that way. No, I'm still gonna fight against it. Uh, like, how much are you really contributing to that bike turning? Uh, on, on on electric bike uh, as opposed to uh, as opposed to a road bike. Like the thing is, the 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 e bikes, the sporty drop handlebar ones are generally quite low assistance grade, so they help you get a bit of a push up the hill. Okay. But once you hit over twenty five k an hour, and like a road bike will easily get twenty five k an hour and hold it a bit beyond that. The motor switches off. Like legally, the motor has to switch off at twenty five k an hour, so it just helps you get up to speed. It preserves the energy of actually getting you up and starting up. But once you're trucking along, there's not that much assistance. Now, with the heavier, more hmm. flat handlebar, more upright bikes, you will generally be at the level of 25k an hour. But like the guy who's in the Lycra in the drop handlebar bike should well be able to hit 25k an hour and keep that up with minimal enough effort. So the guy who's unfit or has a bit of a health issue or just wants to get out and spin the legs, he can actually keep up and give someone a lift up the hill or whatever else. We have little, I hadn't seen them before, little saddlebags that are a tow rope now that actually go off the back of the e-bikes to tug people up the hill. <laughs> Do you know what? You're beginning to uh, change my mind on these bikes every uh, <laughs> No, Gary, if I have to get towed up a hill off a saddlebar, I'll never hop onto a bike again off a saddlebag. God. The best, story, the best story I heard about the e-bikes, right? Mm. This lad, an experienced cyclist, did a bit of racing. And I, I raced with him in the past. He was saying, yeah, himself and his dad, and his dad used to race back in the day, but his dad's hitting 80 now at this stage. They were over in Spain, and they wanted to go for a spin. So your man, he rented a nice nice road bike to get around on. The dad rented the e-bike. It was a drop handlebar e-bike, so it had a bit, good bit of range on it. And your man was saying, yeah, it was grand. Yeah, we were, were slagging them all. The first hour, second hour, slagging them. You're only cheating. You're only cheating. The dad was there yapping away, not singing the songs all the way up and down the hills, having a rare old time. By hour three, the lads were shutting up and the dad was still talking. And by hour <laughs> four, when they got home, the dad was still fresh. The lads were shattered. Gone to bed. <laughs> the, 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 the dad had fresh legs, fresh lungs, had a minimal dinner. The lads got the usual. They'd empty the tank altogether, so they were eating the full buffet for the whole night. But uh, yeah, it, like, it, it levels the playing field for people who wouldn't be able to get out there and do it. Another great story. I know, look. And, and, it, and absolutely, yeah. I know we, we slagged because we did mm. a charity cycle and, and we were yeah. on the bike on it. And there was a bit of jest there because it was yeah. w- once an electric bike starts racing you, though, that changes the game. I but know, it, um, that's not on. Well, if yeah, you're well, giving you a lift or giving you a tug, grand. <laughs> I was raised 
but it is no different to a people now when I say, oh, I'm going for a run, do you want to come? They're like, Jesus, no, I'm not going running with you. But it is, it puts that equity into company on a cycle. You know, if people know they have the assistance to go on a cycle to with you or they're more likely to go, yeah, actually, I'm not going to be dying. I have this better bike. I can actually, it can be a way of being more inclusive for those who are training heavy that want to include people around them that aren't majorly into the sport, but yeah. can enjoy a tour, can enjoy a long, easy spin. You know, it's, it is good in that sense for getting people involved who wouldn't necessarily have thought they were capable of doing those kind of things. Yeah. And if the battery runs out, Good luck cycling yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you've got that white penalty there as well. That's the thing. So actually, yeah. Well, uh, you keep an eye on that gauge, that fuel gauge all the way around. Yeah, no, but it is it is a great way to think. It's, um, and the cycle to work scheme has, has really helped. I know it's what got me involved in it. It's what got me actually buying a bike or, or, or considering a bike that was more suitable to what I wanted to do as well. Yeah, no, cycle to work's been brilliant for the industry. It's actually like it's, it's it came at just the right time where Ireland was getting more into a fitness kick. Uh, also, I think I think the smoking ban was the first big push that actually got people more healthy. Because so I've lived in various other countries, and you see, you used to see a lot more outdoor activities across the board. Ireland's getting like that now. So the amount of triathlons that are on, there's triathlons on every two every week. These days. yeah, like every, yeah. Every it's, pretty, it's, like, it's just a pity about you know, the weather, and and that's what I, yeah, yeah. I always say to people: if the weather held for six months this would be a great outdoor lifestyle country yeah it would be amazing for that but uh mm. yeah um yeah cycle the work scheme it's it's amazing how easy it is to sell a bike on someone who's worked the work scheme because it also the, the, the one of the great things it did was it actually some people would say that the cycle the work scheme made bikes more expensive it didn't really bikes pre pre-2009 were at very low quality. There was stuff that you wouldn't see on for sale in Europe or for sale in shops in Ireland. Because people still had a price point of the Rally Burner BMX they bought in the eighties for fifty five pounds. They thought that was an expensive bike. Like, I've been right the, the bikes I was buying in the late nineties. Like I had one bike that was worth over five thousand pounds in the late nineties. Nineties money. So That's there, was pro- there was proper bikes out there. But like there was very few and far between. And for the level of quality that we're seeing there now, for people to be on competition grade bikes, like they do start at around around nine hundred quid, will get you something that will get you around the ring of carry around the wicket at two hundred. It's not going to be as good as the bike of fifteen or, or two thousand euros, but you do have that entry point now, and you don't get the bikes below that quality point anymore until you go to some of the bigger box retailers. Like, and this this is the thing about value for the cycle to work scheme is uh, if you want to think. Uh, the cycle to work scheme is up to price bikes price your bike in France it's the manufacturer who's setting the price point and yeah. the shop size may add 100 it may add 200 yeah. but bikes price is pretty much the price and then consider buying your bike in France and then go actually do you know what the cycle to work scheme is not a bad deal and then it's, yeah. a, it's a good deal again yeah but like, like it's, it's been great like, to see the, the non-electric entry point now is what 1250 euros 1200 yeah and then um, the e-bike credit is, is greater fifteen hundred. Now they could do it actually raising it a bit more because you don't get much of an e-bike for that sort of money. And then the cargo bikes, the cargo bikes are three thousand. It's great fun because that'll get a lot of people out of the cars and get the kids dropped off to school. And everything. That's the, that's amazing to have there now. One thing I've seen as well is people on their cargo bikes with the dog and the kid in the basket and they're oh, yeah, cycling it's, around it's the park. Yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. absolutely brilliant looking. Yeah, yeah, and even I've seen people out training. There was, I was coming in from town there the other day and there was a lady on a Trek racer and then someone was on a big cube cargo bike with two kids in the front because he was electric, he was keeping pace with her. The two, the two, <laughs> they were yapping along, kids and all, she was doing a bit of training. They were still trucking along at 20 odd K an hour through traffic. It was great. Very and great. that's that's the whole idea of being inclusive and especially when you're doing these long sports like an Ironman, it's lonely. I'm going to be honest, yeah. I've done a hell of a lot of training on my own. And although it would be nice to have people come along with me, they're not matching the paces or the powers I need to yeah. be at, or I'm not matching where they need to be. And that's where those little bikes, that little push can be like, oh, I can actually go with you on this one. And I can yeah. be like, oh, no, they're sticking with me. Uh, <laughs> More pressure. Yeah, got a target. Keep you, keep you, keep you honest, keep you, keep you training. So I suppose 
we've we've covered a lot of the basics and i suppose more questions um will be generated from the podcast people will have follow we we won't necessarily cover everything Aaron. we'll send them on to you and we'll try and answer them on yeah, one of our sure, look, we'll, we'll definitely come back for for questions if you have if anyone has as often uh, because i think i get into the granular detail of what makes a bike good and i think that's so much more the fans have well let's do that because yeah. The base knowledge, respectfully, we're about to step it up a gear, pun intended. Yeah. So I had my initial bike fit with you because I was going to do an Ironman, but the Ironman was on my felt FR, my entry level yeah. that we're telling people to get. So it is doable, and I've been training on it, and it's been the red rocket for four years. But yeah. I'm taking on Ironman in Portugal, and I want don't want to be out there all day. I can do it on this bike. I 100% can do it and we know I can do it, but yeah. I want to make a difference in this cycle. The gauntlet is down on a time and I wanted to see how close to that I can get. How good we can get. And that's when I walked in and I met Mick and Mick was like, girl, come here. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Look at the size of this fella. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, that was, yeah, that was my, my experience and we could have and, and this is where I'm being and, and I back you up on the point of it's not necessarily the brand you're selling I went in with a bike in my head that I seen that was shiny and nice online and I was like I was thinking of buying a Trek Madone uh, SL6 I think and the guys were like how about you have a look at this bike because the size was a size 62 it was probably more fitted to me and for the spec of it, it was two and a half grand cheaper than the nearest Jeez. Trek bike. Now, that's a couple of things, and I'm not going to disparage any brands that we don't sell in, in the superstore there, but it's a cube of phenomenal value for money. They're a German brand, and they're, they're emerging on the market, and it's only of their first race team the past few years, so they do price themselves remarkably competitively. And as a result, like we're able to, with yourself, Eric, you're able to tweak the bike exactly where you are and still keep you under budget, because we get Eric's actually basically buying two bikes with this one. <laughs> We're setting them up for the Ironman, but then he's going to have a great road bike afterwards. That's, and, that's the beauty of it. And that is that is the thing. So when I walked in, Mick has phenomenal experience as well, and he guided yeah. me towards the cube. Was like, look, you're looking for all the mod cons. You will not get the same quality for the same price. Yeah. And Gar backed him up, and then I was like, right, well, how do we turn this into an Ironman bike? And that's where. Gar's expertise and the staff's expertise were absolutely phenomenal. So stage one was with Gar and we said between the two of them, Mick and, Mick and Gar were back and forth, but let's put this on now, let's put this on. They were just solving all of Eric's problems in front of him. <laughs> I just shut up for a few minutes and all of a sudden there was an aluminium handlebar going on uh, with TT bars that are going to put me into a position. So I've now got a carbon handlebar that's no use but I've got an until I'm going on just a cycle yeah. I've got an aluminium bar that's going to hold the TT bars to keep me in a good position the pedals we had to decide on that were going to fit me the best get the best quality the power meters all of this happened within about four, 40 minutes maximum yeah. and I was booked in to come back into you a week later Gar, for the bike fitting yeah, so well, it's, uh couple of things, just want to run through a few things. Um, mm. The difference between a, a tri bike, a triathlon bike, and a road bike. So, your road bike is your standard racer with the drop handlebars, and everyone, you, you see them all over the place. A triathlon bike is the, the ones you see on the Ironman course with the much more aggressive lower down position on it. There's, you'll never make a road bike into a full tri bike because the angle of the position of the seat post, but you can have a very good stab of it. And when we're when I'm doing a, an Ironman style fit on a road bike, you need to be able to put clip on bars onto onto a handlebar. The cube as stock came with um, a lovely all in one cockpit, but it's an aero profile on it, so it's a teardrop profile on the top of the handlebars and you can put the extenders on. And I know Eric's level of flexibility. You want to give not great in, you want to give a good buffer in the hips. To allow the spine to be recover for the run after the hour after the after the cycle, so I needed to buffer in a uh, a good rise ability on it. So the the brand we sell in the superstore there is the Profile Design range, and that has all the options for the extenders and then the riders to get them up. And just because we were fitting them onto that, we needed to go with an optional handlebar. Ultimate 
them, just to get what we call the whole cockpit weight on the cube. It's a couple of hundred euros to do that, but it's well worth in the end. And we can always just take off the tip on bars and we've got a top end road look at the end of it. Um, I have some pictures here just to show Sean in the background here. I'm actually going to minimize my camera off. Okay. To talk some numbers, right? Um, now, the, the listeners can't see this, but if you want, I can send you on the pictures I actually have later for. Yeah, we'll, we'll put them up on, on, on the post we put up when the day comes out. We'll put the pictures to go with this. So hopefully no one's listening to this podcast while driving and trying to go through these pictures. You know what's going on. Why are you looking at it later? We will try and talk to right. it. You should be yeah. taking a leap out of cars, but can be cycling. Get out of that car. <laughs> exactly. uh, sorry, give us a second. I'm going to jump in here. You should still be able to see this. So there's, there's a man in his triathlon position. So what I'm looking at there, this is close to final on the bike. So when I get someone in for a bike lift, first thing I do is we do a physical assessment to see what level of flexibility we're at, see if there's any issues with the, any broken bones, any range of motion issues, any flexibility issues. Then um, for road bike cycling, we have a target back angle of around 45 degrees. So target angle from the hips to the shoulders of 45 degrees. For people doing triathlon, um, especially longer distance triathlon, we aim for that back angle to be closer to 35 degrees. Um, there, there's a range there as well. And for longer distance triathlon, you do need to add a bit of a buffer to raise things up. So if I get this picture here, um, this is a good indicator. This is Eric's Ironman position for most of it. Now, when he's in this position... You'll just have to slide your head a little bit, Gary, just oh, so sorry, Sean can see. Oh, sorry, on the camera. Let me drop this off. Sorry. Um, I'll just back to yourself. So what Gary's showing us now is, ah, there we go. This is a picture of me actually after the bike fit. Yeah. Okay. This this is during the process. Yeah. yeah. So so can but, you see the second picture moving around? No, you can't. It's an overlay on this. So I'm actually just going to go through the video and actually grab it. Um, so this is him where he's going to be for most of the Ironman position. If you just keep an eye there on the shoulder, the back angle in this position. If I go to the numbers. Now, the retail sensor that he's wearing those pictures there are 3D motion capture. So I have a camera that captures him in motion. And this is the number I was actually looking at here. So if I go on to this, this is with the risers on with a 120 stem. This is leg extension, leg contraction, and ankle angle. These are all in the central in the zone. So I'm really happy with this. But then I go looking at the back angle. Back angle, a target for triathlon is between 30 and 40. He's hitting 34 degrees there. Now, I was really happy when he got that out of, out of the extender position. But then, you're not always going to be able to be on those extenders because your brake controls aren't there and your gear controls aren't there. So, what I tried to do then is... So, just a second, guys, just to highlight. So, the yeah. position Gary has shown us now, for those who are listening, it's me in the comfortable position. So, my elbows are pretty much on the crossbars, on risers, in a comfortable padded and my hands yeah. are directly out in front of me on, on the aero bars for those who don't yeah. understand what we're describing. And that yeah. position um, is matching the angles that Gary is talking about that I should be in for this long distance. That's going to get me off yeah. a bike and get me running a marathon. Yeah. Uh, the other one we look at is the, uh, the, the elbow closure angle. So from the, from the shoulder to the elbow, uh, we aim for around 90 degrees on that. So you, you'll actually be a little bit more forward on the bike when you see it just from this still here. So I'm just going to move us forward here a little bit on this video. Um, so when the man gets down into the drops here now, the key thing I was trying to keep is the back angle for when he's down in the gear control. So when he puts his hands down low, his back angle is pretty much identical. So he hasn't lost any aero, adva any aero advantage being down there. So on a triathlon bike, that would be equivalent to the base bar. So if I just pair that back up, the, sh the shoulders barely move. Gotcha, yeah. Uh, on, the, on the data screen, right? The data screen will show you the angle was actually it's this number here. So in that position he was actually at thirty six degree back angle. So really, really So there's a that. between there's two degree difference between me coming out of the comfortable position into where I'm gonna be controlling it down. You're, you're barely moving basically when your your arms yeah. Yeah. barely yeah. barely so, moving, but in very efficient like, and yeah. always in a in an aero position, yeah. but not too aero, as Gary was saying, not in the aggressive position. Um, we and need to keep a buffer in the hips just to keep the, the, the spine nice and supple for the, for, the, for the run. And then the other thing, uh, when we're into the gear hoods here now, actually we'll cover you there again. 
gear hoods in standard rowboat position on this machine were hitting the back angle here is actually 46 degrees where it's actually I was aiming for I was actually aiming for 45 but that's close enough in the fitting ones when we're on the final bike for the final build we'll get that exact but uh, I'm really happy with the outcome of this fit here so and and what people can't see in this and and it's something we'll put up pictures of and Gary will send us mm. on the pictures afterwards and the next fitting what we'll do is we'll record a lot of the fitting. Sean might actually come with us and we'll go through the whole yeah, process yeah. So, so people can get a feel for what's actually happening. But there's little stickers on every part of me from my foot, my knees, every, yeah. every joint that's going up my body that's yeah, showing so you the angles through each rotation of my Sean, legs. You can see my mouse here. So um, yeah. when I don't have the software running, column three is what we can actually see here. So this here is the sticker that's on his knee. So that actually refers to this. And this is the... The inwards outwards the 3d motion part of it so you want to get a straight line of the knee you don't want the knee to be flecked anyway so by getting the cleat stabilized getting the shoe stabilized and just making sure if there's any correction you need to do at the at the sole level we can get the knee to track as straight as possible that's pretty much straight as a die which when i look at the numbers here this is the full data set that we get the jesus knee <laughs> Just, just for people listening, like there's, there's around, there's a twenty two. Oh my God, he just scrolled down. There's around 30, 40 different things. Without exaggerating, yeah. you're looking at different angles, yeah. like but this, foot rotations, room, extensions of yeah. knees, hips, when the guys eyeballs. Moving, this, this is actually moving these days. These numbers actually change. So the guy's pedaling away here, and you actually see this tracker coming up and down. So there's, yeah, there's like, eight different moving points you're looking at: wrist, elbow, shoulder, hip, knee. Two at the ankle, from what I can see there, uh, and the yeah. toes then as well. So two on the foot, one at the ankle, the knee, the hip, the shoulder, then the elbow, and the, and the, the wrist. Uh, so, in this, uh, in both cases here, in both positions, Eric's knee was only moving two degrees off off that straight, which is ideal. Oh wow! Yeah, um, and that, and that so, comes down to power and mechanics. So, if your knees yeah. are bending out or turning in by massive degrees, you're losing power to the outward motion yeah. of your leg. Mm. The more straight you can drive the piston, the more power you're exerting through the pedal. And that's why yeah. that's why bike fits are so important yeah. for energy efficiency, for comfort. You heard Gary talking about keeping supple in the back so we can get off the bike and run. Would I be able to do a marathon or, or an Ironman without it? Yes. Would I suffer? 100%. Yeah. But so it's, just it's show a, you, I'm just going to jump the numbers here for... This is the felt from a couple of years back because I keep age data, and then I'm gonna get the agree, which is the new bike in the in the hoods position. Because I when I have gears. age data, when I have age data, what I do is I try and match people as close as possible to their to their their old bike, their old fit. Now, the measurements on the bike will actually change a little bit because the bikes have changed a little bit and there's different levels of flex we're dealing with. But, like, I do fettle the saddle maybe one or two mil over the course of a fit. And then when a bike is brand new as well, I do want to see people a, uh, a couple of weeks later because the saddle, the saddle's fresh out of the box, the foam is still pretty firm. And you just need gotcha. to that settle in a little bit. So, and even I get people to bring their shorts that they're competing in. Short padding can change. So the, the pads on the short will actually will change quite a bit as well. That makes uh, sense. Yeah. So on column one on this screen here now is at the relaxed position on the queue and the old felt. So the old felt we had them at forty four degrees. Uh the arms are a bit more straight on this. So the position on the two bikes in the, the hoods in the standard road bike position is pretty much identical. So I'm happy I was at then we actually fettled in the extender and everything. The fact that we can compare to a, ver a previous version of yourself. So the cool. level of details, phenomenal. Do you have a picture there of of, of Eric when when he first came in, his first fitting, and and, and seeing that uh, that kind of difference? Yeah, I can, or I can bring up this video here. Uh, so, because the cube was just it was a fresh bike, we don't have a before and after. Okay. Look at the, look at the mask because it was cold. Look at the state of time, right? Oh wow! So this is when he arrived in, right? This is the first time I met the man. Like you can see, even maybe it's just no hair. Like no hair. Yeah, <laughs> more hair than me so, there still. So what I'm gonna do is look here. Well, like the first thing I do when I get so to the I mean, 
Oh yeah. Now he's down the drops are now, is he? Do you give him any cues on it? You just want to see how he cycles here. Is, is that yeah, what happens? When they come in first, I'm just assessing to see what's wrong with the bike now. Before we go to the after video on this, I'm just looking here. Cleats, probably, you'll probably going to adjust them in and out a little bit just to get them right. His leg extension isn't right. You need to actually raise that saddle a little bit. Um, the other thing I look at is where the knee is when it's over this position here. Mm. Uh, that saddle is too far forward by around 15 mil. Because his knee is that much over the pedal spindle. That's a key metric we actually use. So he's actually, the saddle is too far forward altogether. Back angle isn't bad. And he is what I call Frankenstein a little bit. The shoulders are up into the sockets. He's mm. low range of motion in the sockets there now. So I'm actually just going to load up the um, the after video on this session here. So It's funny because get, so he's taking there's the sockets. after. Uh, so after I get into the same leg position, I always take the metrics out of. So, mm. so there the leg is extending, the the foot isn't overextending. The you can see the dots on him from the centre. The knee is over the pedal spindle, even though it's blurred there. Arms are well open, arms are relaxed, the elbows are able to flex. So that's that's a much more that's a that's a proper foot kind of bike. That's, that's it's the absolutely best. That's amazing. The past and, of years. and just to highlight. Gar's expertise as he was looking at me raw on the bike there what happened in that fitting is we tried to raise the seat post because he was like no you're not in the right seat position yeah. we ran out of seat post the seat yeah. post wasn't big enough therefore the bike was probably a frame too small but remember as Gar said at the start you can build into a smaller frame bike you can make it yeah. fit and we ended up getting replacing the seat post with a bigger yeah, one get a to get me into the right so on that bike in itself I was never going to be in the right position until I met Gar. And that has got me through the Miz and Tamalin. It's got me through all the training I've done to date. And now yeah. we're taking it a step further with yeah. the try bars, with everything else. And it's just highlighting again how important it is for a bike fit. And when you're getting a bike, not only to just make sure you're in the right position, you're staying injury free, Gar. You're, you're feeling how it is to ride a bike correctly. So when you start off riding a bike correctly, you'll know whenever a bike is not right for you. Mm. Yeah. And it's a phenomenal start. You're going to avoid injuries. You're, you're, yeah. you're getting expertise. Like I was watching Gar put together this, put together that. And I was like, I have to take this bike apart to fly to Portugal. And I was like, Gar, can I come back in and uh, <laughs> get you to show me how to take this bike apart yeah. and put it back together again? Yeah. There's, there's expertise and knowledge that it goes beyond. And, and, Oh, it's a shame as a podcast we'll have to start putting up YouTube videos of this but mm. it's it's um it's absolutely phenomenal to see the difference in me and the comfort difference because what used to cause me to suffer through 90 100 kilometers I'd be like there's no way I could do this after a bike fitting it's oh that 180k wasn't that bad today actually yeah. my legs are a bit tired but it's amazing the difference it makes into your efficiencies, into your comforts, yeah. into your physical. The efficiency is the key. Just to show Sean this here, like just so you know, well, I'm looking at this here in the post fitting, right? What's happening here is the bike is actually supporting the skeleton. So from the hips to the shoulders to the hands, that's a triangle. It's a good 90 degree triangle. Mm -hmm. That's a natural, natural stability point there. So that's, that means your core is supporting your shoulders. Your hands aren't taking a lot of weight in those barrels there. That's, but that's why you're not actually extending the like, it's there for a lot of energy because all those there. And the other thing, just about the power delivery, like it's if the saddle is too low, you're going to be putting too much weight on uh, on the actual on the uh, on the bum there and actually causing a bit of discomfort. The um, the other thing I find a lot, especially people who are triathlon training, and Eric's a good example of this here. When we're looking up and over, he doesn't have great flexibility at the top of the pedal stroke, so the, the ankle can't actually drop anymore. Um, and this is why we would actually look at raising the saddle a little bit more because what's happening here is the the ankle is pretty much at the, the max range of motion here and sort of pushing the thigh up and out a little bit just to rock rock the hips a little bit. So we find get the sweet spot of the saddle height there. And then for power delivery, the fore and aft is great. Now you're going to see, Eric, on the actual new bike, when you've got the power meter, he can point you and you to exact, exact. So he'll get you off to do 10K, take a read back and do another 10k you'll fettle that saddle there exactly how that, that, that's what you're saying to do that. and and when you're going for distances like ironman it's all about power it's all about yeah. how you can hold that power like moving, yeah. 
Yeah, it, it is the aim of the game over the distance. Phenomenal. So I think we've blown Sean's mind, Gar. I think. Yeah, I think well, we'll, well, yeah. Sean as well. Like, like, get yourself in for a fifth. You actually go through the lock. Well, and Eric's coming in for the the <laughs> final pick up of the bike. Right, we'll we'll run through an actual fitting as if he was walking in on it, and we'll take all the measurements again in the video. If you saw what the bike I come in with, Gary, you'd send me back. <laughs> <laughs> you'd be like, "Bike that belongs in that recycling bin over there. Uh, you need a brand new bike, son." Um, like the green, so, the green machines that used to slide around the corner. Yeah, maybe, maybe October, November for next season. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But even if, if you are definitely, if you're looking at a bike, you can grab a bike mm. off the shop floor and get you fitted onto that as well. But uh, the other thing I do offer as a service, if people don't have a bike. I have the, the retool um, move bike, which is an adjustable machine. So we can dial in any bike off a catalog and actually simulate that. Like oh, wow. As people are pedaling, you can actually adjust it and actually track it up. Now, I do find we get better results. It's, it's a quicker process to do it on, on the actual bikes we're going to be. But for guys who are actually doing like mail order sort of bikes or custom frames, I've got a few custom frames made up off this. So we work off the basic templates. You can try different handlebar widths, different stem lengths, different crank lengths. We can personalize all that, get the different saddle on, then get the ideal fit on that on the data, and then we order the bike based off that, and then we actually work backwards and build up the bike and take it all those measurements. I mean, that that sounds like a, a, a lot more hassle for someone who's just wants that particular bike and has a mindset. And I mean, Eric's red bike, that, that sounds to me like he should never have gotten that bike if you have to start changing no, saddle heights like, and stuff like that. Um, No, like it's like it's... If you have the bike, we can generally make the bike work for you. But uh, before you purchase, like definitely you're better off getting the fitting first. Yeah, not not even a full fitting, just to make sure everything's going to be in the ballpark. Because I knew, like, because I fitted Eric before, I knew what measurements we actually needed. Like myself or Mick or any of the lads in the shop now, uh, the older lads, the more experienced you're going to be, we'll take one or two looks at you and say, yeah, we need to do this, this, and this on the bike. I got the bike customized to yourself. Not to blow smoke up your, your your backside, but I'm assuming now, like when you look at someone on a bike before, like the numbers are just you probably have an eye for at this stage what's going on, and the numbers are just backing up what you're saying. So if you probably like like you said at the start of the podcast, if you're cycling behind someone for two minutes, you can probably see straight away this, 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 and this. Um just just for the, the general Joe Soap walking in like myself. So the general Sean walking in, like what do you see is the the most kind of I suppose just takeaways for people listening. Um, common mistakes people are making when they have a bike already purchased that's coming into our fitting, and you're like, "This person's after doing this, this red flag again and again." You see popping up, like, or is it different because, for everyone? Because I'm seeing people from buying bikes from all over the country and all over the world. A lot of the time, people are very close, but it's the last couple okay. of adjustments is actually getting it right. Now, in some cases things are well off. Worst case I had is one guy, I had to raise the saddle seven centimeters, I had to extend his handlebars three centimeters before I fit it. And this guy was off doing 150, 100, 200k cycles with a club, and no one was telling that his bike was that far off. Like, that's a crazy amount. But one of, the, one of the big things I'm seeing at the minute now is cleat position. There's been a lot of research where we put the cleats to, to optimize biomechanics on it. Mm. And especially guys who've been racing and riding the bikes for the last 20, 30 years. They have no play to themselves. And even myself, after I got my first retail fit from, from Shane, the guy who was before me, um, it actually took me the guts of a year to get used to the actual proper modern position because I had to unlearn. I had to unlearn 20 years of riding and just the position I actually got myself accustomed to. Um, especially when I went to the newer shaped saddles. The saddles now have got wider and shorter. And that took me six weeks to get used to. But getting... The most important thing I would say is the contact points. Get the shoes right, get the saddle right, get the hand position right, and then get the fitness up after that. Because once once you know, you're not going to do yourself any damage on the bike when you don't know. Mm. And um, there was a lady that was there to help me. Rachel, was it Rachel who was with me that oh, day? Rachel, Rachel's amazing. Couldn't be kind of Rachel is amazing. So yeah. not only was I there to do a bike fit, I was there yeah. to get kitted out for for an Ironman. And, and I said it to Sean before I went in, I was like, I can buy cheap, I can buy twice, or I can put the best gear on me yeah. and then just see what happens. And then there's no excuses. Then there's no, well, if I had, I had this, that, and the other. Yeah. But anyway, I was walking around looking at helmets, kicking shoes and going, I've no idea. And <laughs> Mick and, and Gary were like, 
you need to talk to Rachel. <laughs> and they found Rachel in the corner. She was throwing helmets around and happy as Larry upstepped Eric. Within 15 minutes, I was after being in and out of the train changing room with the perfect tri suit that fit me first time. She picked a helmet that fit me perfect. She because everyone's all about the aero helmet for triathlon and she showed it to me put it on she was like i don't think it's for you and i was like no you're right she could just tell by me what was working brought me down got a, a fantastic helmet that's kind of the hybrid aero but road helmet shoes she was putting things she was like i don't like them on you i don't think they're right then we we ended up ordering another pair of shoes in from a supplier to get me into the exact shoes she thinks now that um and subsequently all the kit and equipment match, so I'm going to be very matching for the Ironman. <laughs> she was absolutely phenomenal and had a phenomenal wealth of experience from her own experience in the middle distance. Yeah, talk to Rachel's been with the, with the tour for almost ten years now at this stage, but she brilliant. She looks after all the all the all the clothing these days, but the tri gear and shoes in particular, like the range of wetsuits that are there, it's just a heck of a lot of clothes. It's absolutely yeah, phenomenal. Yeah. So if you are, and I'll reiterate, and Gar, we, we, we've taken enough of your time tonight. Mm -hmm. we, we'll have to start wrapping it up. But those who can listen or, or those who can or are interested in the sport, it, was a, it really was a one-stop shop for me to get the best advice because I've no idea what I'm doing. Let's call it a bit of having a breeze what I'm doing. But as I said to Lorcan, I've no excuses now. I still think of 20. But I've no excuse. I've got the best bike fit from one of the best bike fitters that I can find who was honest with me, wasn't trying to sell me things. It was just, no, this can work. We'll make this work. You've got a great bike under you. I was like, but should I be buying the more expensive? I was like, don't worry about it. Look at the spec you've got. We'll make this work. This is fantastic. Someone wasn't trying to sell me the best, the most expensive helmet. They were like, nah, it doesn't work for you. This is the best thing. And Rachel got involved. Mick has been working on the power meters for me, getting everything. And I just left amazed. I was like, this is brilliant. I feel like I have a chance now. And that's just for me, who's had a little bit of experience. But going in as a beginner, you're going to be so looked after. It is it's a it is an experience. It is a big investment. It's an investment in you. And if I can recommend it to anyone, just walk in. Just walk in with an open mind and say, I'd like to be able to cycle to work. I'd like to be able to cycle 70K. And just watch the magic happen and just trust in the process. And it's it's absolutely amazing. Gary, do you have any um social or any any way people can get in touch or see more of your stuff online? Uh, myself right now is uh GaryWarrenBikeFit.com. You get uh, it's the website there available for bookings and all the info on, on the services I actually offer. Um the, the retail motion bike fits there. You will find me most days of the week, weekday mornings in Cycle Superstore on the shop floor there as well. But uh, uh, on the website, there you get all my contact details. I do have an Instagram set up, but it's fairly inactive at the minute. I'm useless to actually update and stuff on it. But uh, if you need to get me, get me either through the Cycle Superstore number. It's there, 31 Ayrton Road, 01463 That's 01463 On weekdays, you get me. You get Mick if you need any advice on bikes or any of the staff can actually update you. Drop into the shop there. It's a stunning showroom if you haven't been in. They have bikes, they have the entry-level kids' bikes, they have commuter bikes. But if you want to see the top, top of the line, world-class race spec bikes, like there's there's a, a gallery of some fantastic machines up there. Even if you're not buying, just go and have a look and see what people are actually on because you actually get an experience there. Wetsuits, tri suits, no. the whole shebang, um, well fitted for all that. That's the Cycle Superstore, Thirty One Ayrton Road in Tala. Myself, Gary Bourne on GaryBourneBikeFit.com. Um, Hit the lads up if you need to get me. I'm sure the lads through your own socials bounce them onto myself. Any questions? If you want to get me back in for actually bike tech questions, John, then no problem at all. Even over here. And we will see you in the next couple of weeks, um, Gar. Yeah. We will put on the, our own social media of yeah. the process of me going through the fit for for the Ironman. We'll have all the gear. We'll have the shoes. Everything that we talked about on this. I know a lot of it was was for Sean's benefit in terms of showing the visuals, and uh, we tried to keep you as in touch as we can. Those who are listening, but. If you do want to see more, do visit the website. Thanks so much, Gary, for coming on to this week. It's yeah, no been, at all. It's been fantastic. Great. Yeah, and like I say, Eric, you don't know what most of your stuff is there, right on the parameter. So it's like it's yeah. <laughs> hint, hint. get back yeah, in no, here. No, it's only it's like it's 
I need to fit you on the actual components themselves because I changed a couple of things from that fit because I got some better suited bars and stuff. So we'll just do another quick fitting session to get that all exact. I want to get you start training on the bike now, actually, because the clock is taking on the calendar there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Sounds... if I didn't need another reminder, I have to get back on my glorious belt that's sitting on a turbo for an hour. So thanks so much, Gary, and again. Thanks to everyone who's listened this week uh, for this week's episode of the Any Given Run Day podcast. Sean, anything else to add this week? No, that's it for myself. Gary, thank you again. And Eric, take care. Bye. Bye.